Okay. So now we're going to talk about projectiles and charged particles. What you guys did last year, we basically said ignore air resistance. We are now going to talk about air resistance. Um, air resistance is a force which is in proportional to, or is in the opposite direction of velocity. So we quantify air resistance by writing it as a function of the velocity in principle. Um, now, this so far is not very specific. It just says that it can be dependent on the velocity and that it is in the direction of velocity. Um, and in basically all cases, it is opposite to the direction of velocity, so it is always working against the motion. Um, we're going to talk about two very specific cases, um, which is when it is proportional to the velocity and proportional to the velocity squared. Um, that you will notice, dear followers, that it, you can also describe this as a Taylor series. So we are going to write this as we're going to, we, we don't have a term which is constant. Um, so we will, I can call it F1 um, times the velocity, and it is going to be in the direction, the opposite of the direction of velocity. And then F2, velocity squared, v hat. Um, and we will even um, follow the notation in the book and call these two constants B and C. So we are talking about the linear term and the nonlinear term. Now, in principle, you can have higher order terms. Um, what we're talking about here microscopically is not really, it's not anything that you can describe analytically. What's going on microscopically is as something moves through the air, it is getting hit by, uh, by particles in the air. There are collisions. The object loses energy to collisions with the air. Um, and there's nothing deep in this statement. This is saying basically you can always describe anything as a Taylor function, um, it, as the Taylor expansion of its terms. There's, um, and then uh, empirically, we note that you do not have a constant air resistant term. That kind of makes sense because physically, a constant air resistance term would mean whether or not you're moving, there's air resistance. Um, I guess if you had some, th this is the relative velocity of the air to the object. So if you had air flowing over something, there could be a term which is um, constant for the, the motion of the thing that is experiencing it. But uh, it is, this is really the relative velocity. So you don't have a force when two objects are not moving um, relative to each other. Um, and then there's nothing deep. This is just a Taylor series, and empirically we can talk about what those constants are. Um, and there are cases when, um, when this is not exactly direct, it is not always proportional to the um, direction of the velocity, such as the sideways force on an airplane wing that causes it to lift. In that case, the air is going in this direction and the force is, um, is up. Um, so this is not always true. It's true to a pretty good approximation in most cases. Um, and in the cases, the only cases that we're going to consider here. Um, and life is a Taylor series, this esoteric thing that you didn't think you would ever see again when you were taking math cal calculus. You probably thought, why am I learning this? You're learning it because it comes up everywhere. All right. Um, so... We call this F lin, or your book calls it F lin. It is a viscous drag, and it is also proportional to the size of the object. Um, this is uh, F quadratic, the quadratic force. Um, and it is proportional to the density, density of the medium and the cross-sectional area of the object. Um, so, we will work with B equals some constant we will call beta times the diameter, so it is proportional to um, the size of the object, and C is 
proportional to the diameter squared, so the cross-sectional area. Um, and we're going to limit ourselves to spherical objects because those are relatively straightforward problems. Um, you can always approximate everything as a sphere. And remember, what we're building up here is not exact solutions. We are building up a system so that you can make approximations that guide you in, for when you have to come up with a more complicated situation. So when you have to come up to a, with a solution for something more complicated. Um, and then uh, we can, if we are specifically talking about air, beta is approximately 1.6 times 10 to the negative fourth newton seconds per meter squared. We're going to check units in just a second. Gamma is about 0.25 newton seconds squared per meter to the fourth. Okay, so then um, if we check units, beta, so we need to get meet newtons on both sides, so kilogram meters per second squared. Let me just, this side has newtons, so I'm just going to leave it as newtons have to equal beta newton seconds per meter squared times d, d has units of, si units of meters, times velocity has units of meters per second, and you can see indeed that this is equal to newtons. Gamma, we have to have this term also have units of newtons, and we need units of gamma, newtons, seconds squared per times meters to the fourth, times meters squared, times meters squared per second squared, and here there's four powers of meters on the top and four powers of meters on the bottom, meters to the fourth on the top, meters to the fourth on the bottom, second squared on the top, second squared on the bottom. And those all cancel out, and we are, in fact, left with newtons. Always good to check your units. Make sure that you know um, that you know how that, that you know how you end up getting the right units. <clears throat> all right, and then usually, so in the cases that we are going to cover in this class, um, there are we're going to be able to neglect one term or the other, either the um, quadratic term or the linear term. And then to figure out which one, um, we're going to look at the ratio. So we're going to take the ratio of, oh, I want to switch back to my bright marker. I love bright markers. Um, the ratio of the quadratic force to the linear force. So when this is greater than 1, we have to worry about the quadratic term. And when it is less than one, we have to worry about the linear term. Or when it's close to one, we have to worry about both. When it is much less than one, uh, then we can't worry about the linear term. And then it's much greater than one, we worry about the quadratic term. So this is CV squared over BV. This is gamma D squared V over beta d, oh, this is a v squared, this is a v, and we are left with gamma over beta dv, and you plug the numbers in, this turns out to be 1.6 times 10 to the 3 seconds per meter squared d times v. So, um, the larger your object is, the um, more likely it is that the quadratic term is dominant. The higher the speed, the more likely it is that the quadratic term is dominant. And when you are, um, so when you are dealing with things that are very small and very slow, you might only have to worry about the linear term. When you are dealing with uh, things that are very large or very fast, you're more likely to worry to have to worry about the um, quadratic term.
Okay. All right, so we're going to consider a few examples um, and what happens in those cases. Uh, this is example 2.1. Um, and we have a baseball um, which has a diameter of seven centimeters and a speed of five meters per second. Notice I'm using V for the magnitude of velocity, and that is speed. We have a raindrop. Um, and this has a diameter of one millimeter and a speed of 0.6 meters per second. Uh, an oil droplet like used in the Millikan oil drop experiment. So a very tiny oil drop. D is 1.5 micrometers. And the speed is 5 times 10 to the negative fifth meters per second. In this case, so here now we're looking at F quad over F lin. Um, and for the baseball, this is 600. So this is much greater than one. You only have to worry about the quadratic term. For the raindrop, this is one. So if you're considering how rain moves through the air, you have to consider both the linear and the quadratic term. And for the oil drop in the Millikan experiment, this is 10 to the negative seventh. So you only have to worry about the linear term. Um, so for very small and slow objects, you only consider linear, the uh, linear term for fast and large objects, so this would be most of the objects that we, we see macroscopically, um, you have to consider the quadratic term. And for some cases where you're somewhere between small and, uh, and slow and large and fast, you have to consider both. Okay, so now we're going to start by considering linear air resistance, and we're going to go through the math to solve what this, ha what this does. Um, we're going to be using calculus in a way that you probably haven't quite seen it before, but we're, I want you to keep in mind that what you're doing, you, you know all of the pieces. We're going to start with writing down what we know and take baby steps, and each step should make sense. So linear air resistance, you have mR double dot, this is just Newton's second law, is equal to m. G, that's just saying gravity, um, and then that can be either positive or negative, depending, depending on your coordinate system. V times the velocity. Now we're going to write this mv dot. So now we have an equation which we have a first order because the highest derivative is um, the highest order derivative is a first order derivative. If we'd done it this way, it would be a second order derivative. We now have a first order differential equation, which is linear in all of the terms. So we now know, now we can um, factorize this. Um, so we will assume standard Cartesian coordinates with y positive going up. And we can write this as m vx dot equals negative v vx. So uh, there, whatever the component of the velocity is in the x direction, you, uh, your force is just proportional to that, the magnitude of the velocity in the x direction, the force in the x direction is m v y dot is equal to m g v, v, y, we can get away with uh, m, g, minus b, y. Um, we can get away with this because uh, our v, v hat is just v, x hat plus v, x, x hat plus v, y, y hat. If we, um, so when we get to the quadratic term, you will see that we can't do that because v squared v hat 
is <clears throat> does not factorize. You end up dependent on um, the, two, the two terms are coupled. Okay, so examples would be a car or a cart rolling along. Um, with linear air resistance, it's going to be have to go have to be going pretty slow for linear air resistance to be the only thing that's relevant. Because we saw that a baseball traveling at five meters per second is dominated by the quadratic term. Okay, we're going to start with the x direction. So in the x direction, v x dot equals negative. Um, equals negative b v x. I am going to write this as d v x d t. And I can multiply on both sides by d t and integrate. So I have d v x from v zero x to v x final equals the integral of negative b d t. Ah, sorry, I have to, let me go through a little bit more meticulously. I, I was skipping too many steps. So here I have negative b v x dt equals dvx, and negative b dt equals dvx over vx. I am going to integrate on both sides. Here, I'm going to go from zero, from v at the initial velocity to the final velocity, and here, I'm going to go from zero to time t. So when I do that on this side, I get negative b. Oh, I'm going to just put a t prime just to make it clear um, that this is a variable of the integration variable. Here I get negative b t, and this is negative. Or sorry, this is the natural log of v x. So I have natural log of v f x um, and then minus the natural log of v 0 x and this is natural log of the final velocity divided by the initial velocity so I can write this as I'm going to do e to both sides, so I have e to the negative bt equals e to the natural log of the final velocity divided by the initial velocity, and this is the final velocity divided by the initial velocity. So I get that the final velocity, so I'll just write this as the velocity as a function of time in the x direction, is the initial velocity in the x direction e to the negative bt. So the velocity just decays exponentially. Um, ah, and here, um, I can define, ah, I dropped a term here. So I should have had b over m. So I'm going to correct my equations. Everywhere I have b, I should have b over m. There, that should get it. Um, and we can also define here tau is m over b which lets me write this as v0x e to the negative t over tau. The reason I might want to do that is that by describing this in terms, you know, this is a time constant, it has units of time, and it's going to tell us how quickly the system responds. Now, we want, we typically want the position as a function of time. Now we have the velocity as a function of time. So what we can do is 
This is now dx dt is v zero x e to the negative t over tau. I am going to multiply on both sides by dt. Now, this is a lot easier because when I do that, this is all x, that's all t dependence. We don't have to work as hard. So the integral of the dx, so the integral of dx is just going to give us x. We're going to go from x0 to x final. Here I'm just going to call that integration variable x prime to denote that it's the integration variable, not the final variable. So I've just renamed my variables. v0 x e to the negative t over tau dt. This is going to give me x minus x0 on this side. Here I have uh, v0 x over a negative tau. Here I'm going to go from 0 to t. Um, so e to the negative t over tau. Um, and actually, I messed up the units. This should be v0x times tau. And this makes sense. I screwed up my units here. Meters per second times seconds gives me meters. So that has the right units. And I'm going to evaluate this from t to zero, now I get a v zero x tau, and then the zero gives me, uh, um, this gives me a one, so I have a minus one, or so I have a, here, uh, this I want the, I want to use a t prime just to make things neater. Um, so here I have a negative uh, e to the negative t over tau, uh, and then minus a minus is a plus 1. And this gives me x equals x0 plus v0 x tau 1 minus e to the negative t over tau. So you'll notice here, let's plug in 0. This gives me 1 minus 1. Um, so this gives me a 0, and my x position is x naught. Fantastic. Your book actually used slightly different notation. It said, well, I'm just going to let x equal x naught equals 0. I kind of like doing things in a little bit more general way. We are going to write uh, the answer down over here, and then we're going to attack the y direction. Okay. So, y direction. Okay, so when we look at this equation, the first thing to notice is that we actually do have a terminal velocity where the velocity stops changing. You've probably heard the term terminal velocity. This is where it comes from. When you have, so when you are going sufficiently fast, this term goes to zero. Um, so that happens when mg minus by equals zero. So, or sorry, v, v, this is a typo. This should say vy, not y. So the terminal velocity is when vy equals mg over b. And so we're going to call this v tur, following the, big, the book's notion. Um, and just a little aside, um, I'm going to switch colors. This is example 2.2, the terminal speed of liquid drops, b equals this 
constant beta times the diameter um, and the mass is the, given by the density pi times the diameter cubed over six. I'll leave that as an exercise for the student just from the volume of the sphere. Um, and for then you can uh, plug this in and find that the uh, this v ter is so the mass rho pi d cubed over 6 times g divided by, um, here we have beta times d, and here you're going to get a 2 there, so you have rho pi g d squared over 6 beta. Um, if we have, uh, for the oil drops in the Millikan oil drop experiment, 1.5 times 10 to the negative sixth um, is meters is the diameter. And then um, for a typical oil, you put in the numbers, you get 6.1 uh, times 10 to the um, negative fifth meters per second. So that is a very slow terminal velocity. So that's telling you that you are, because that's the terminal velocity, you are going to reach that terminal velocity relatively quickly. So in the Millikan oil drop experiment, you basically just have things moving at constant velocity. Um, you can also consider a drop of um, water mist um, with a diameter of 0.2, plug the numbers in, and your terminal velocity is equal to 1.3 meters per second. Um, all right. Now we're going to proceed with solving this equation. So we'll use this as a constant, but we're going to consider the cases where um, you're not yet at the terminal velocity. But the behavior that we expect to see is that it's good, the system is going to approach a terminal velocity. So we have, and we can rewrite this as m. Ah, I like my green a little bit better because you guys can see it a little better. Uh, m v y dot is equal to, here we're going to plug in we're going to plug in m g equals v v ter, so we can write this as negative v v y minus v ter so the force of drag is proportional to uh, the difference between the current velocity and the terminal velocity. Uh, so if this velocity is less than, uh, is greater than this velocity, the force is negative. If this velocity is less than this velocity, the, then this is, the drop is going to speed up for the object. Um, and we are going to introduce the variable u equals vy minus v ter. And then u dot is equal to vy dot. So here we have m u dot equals negative v u. And this is equal to m d u d t. We're going to rearrange this by multiplying on both sides by dt. Um, so, and then we're going to divide by u. And that's going to leave us with an equation. This, this is called separation of variables. What we're doing is putting everything 
um, that depends on u on one side and everything that depends on t on the other side. And then we can simply integrate or we can treat the equations separately. So here we have negative b over m dt equals du over u. And here I'm going to go ahead and use our definition of tau equals m over b. So this is going to give us, this is the same thing as negative dt over tau. And note how this is now unitless on both sides. I am going to integrate on both sides. So I have du over u. The integral of du over u is equal to negative dt over t. We're going to go from u0 to u final, and I'm going to just do primes to note different integration. Uh, the variable is not the same thing as what I'm putting the limit in, at least not in general. This looks the same. Uh, this should be, this is over tau. Tau is not a prime. So this gives me negative t over tau. That one's nice and easy. Um, and then this gives me natural log of u over u naught. So I get, I'm going to do e to the natural log of u over u naught, that gives me u over u naught, that is equal to e to the negative t over tau, and I get u equals u naught e to the negative t over tau. And now I'm going to put back in my substitution, so v y minus v Tear equals or v y not minus v tear e to the negative t over tau. Um, and uh, here I then I can write this as v y. Actually, I'm going to put it over here with our answers. Uh, well, we haven't yet integrated. Ah, so we get Vy equals V tear plus Vy naught minus V tear e to the negative t over tau. So notice here that if the difference between the initial position, or the initial velocity, and the terminal velocity is positive, then this term exponentially decays so that you end up with the terminal velocity. If this term is initially, uh, so this is smaller than that, then you are going, you start off slower than the terminal velocity and you are going to exponentially reach the terminal velocity. Okay, now this is exactly equal to dy dt. So we're going to integrate it. We're going to do the same thing. We're going to multiply on both sides by dt. And I have, I'm going to write the, um, all right, so dy dt dt, I have dy from y0 to y final, so I'm going to use a different integration variable just to keep track of it. This is equal to the integral of v ter plus this mass e to the negative t over tau. Here I have lots and lots of parentheses to make sure that I'm multiplying by dt. 
And I'm going to you call my integration variable t prime so that I can integrate all the way to t. And this gives me y minus y0 equals v ter times t uh, and then minus v y0 minus v ter over tau e to the negative t over tau into that evaluated from 0 to t at t equals so this gives me a negative term and this gives me a 1 so this is equal to v ter t plus 1 minus Uh, v y zero minus v ter over tau e to the negative t over tau. So at t equals zero, then this is one, and uh, here I get a. one minus this term. Uh, here I should have a multiplied by a tau. I made a dumb mistake when integrating. No, I have a tau multiplied by a tau. So this is V, Y, yes. This should be multiplied by tau. I should have velocity times time. That gives me units of distance. So here I should have velocity times time. That gives me units of distance. Here there's some simplifications that we can do. I get y of t equals y not plus v ter t and then here I made a couple of mistakes because this is a constant out in front so here I have a v y zero minus v ter tau and then uh, here I have one minus e to the negative t over tau so then my whole expression for the y position is this big ugly mess. Now let's look at what happens in limiting cases um, because we want to make sure that our answer makes sense. Um, so if t equals 0, this term goes to 0, this term equals 0, and the initial, the initial position is, the, y is the initial position. That's good. That's what it's supposed to be. I can then consider um, if this is equal to the term, if the initial velocity is the terminal velocity, this term goes to zero, and my y is equal to the terminal velocity times time. That's good. If I'm already, if I start at the terminal velocity, I don't speed up or slow down, so I just have motion with constant velocity. If this initial velocity is larger, then I have, um, I am approaching exponentially. Um, this term slowly starts going away, um, and as I approach t equals infinity, I approach y equals y naught plus the terminal velocity times time. 
All right, so that all makes sense. Um, what we can do then, I'm gonna write down here my Y solution. Y is, Y not, um, uh, and let's see, I should have had Here, ah, we are falling, so my terminal velocity term should have been negative throughout, because we're talking about an object which is falling. Um, so y not is, or y is y not minus v ter t plus v y not. And then here, this is, by definition, we're choosing the terminal velocity to be in the negative direction. So I have a bunch of sign errors there. And then, ooh, my, I'm going to... Clean this up, and I'm going to keep what we're saving. So this is this times tau e to the negative t over, uh, let's see, I have to have a 1 minus e to the negative t over tau. All right. Okay, so what we can do with this, um, we're interested in the x position as a function of the y position. So we're interested in solving for the trajectory. What we can do is eliminate time. Now, how we're going to eliminate time is first note that this equation, I actually want to change colors to highlight what I'm doing. Um, we can write t times 1 minus e to the negative t over tau is equal to x minus x naught over v zero x and then we can further solve this uh, so first of all this term exists right there but we also have a t so we're gonna get an so this term we're just gonna replace with that and then we have to solve for t and Let's see, so 1 minus e to the negative t over tau equals x minus x naught over v zero x tau, and then 1 minus x over x zero naught v zero x tau equals e to the negative t over tau. So we take the natural log of both sides and we get negative t over tau <laughs> equals the natural log of 1 minus x over x0 naught v zero x tau and t equals negative tau natural log of one minus x minus x naught over v zero x tau. All right, so that is a big ugly equation. We can write 
So, but we are now able to eliminate everything in the y equation that depends on time. y equals y naught minus the terminal velocity plus, switch sign there, tau ln of 1 minus x minus x naught over v0 x tau, and then plus v0 y plus v ter. x minus x naught over v zero x. All right, that is a big, ugly, gnarly equation, but we can work with it. Now, you can plot y, you can, so then you can plot the trajectory of an object, y is a function of x, And we can look at, um, so here, no air resistance, and if you have air resistance, you have uh, the object is going to slow down faster, so it is going to fall faster. Now, we're going to talk about the horizontal range of this object, um, but first, I'm going to, we're, go we're going to take a little aside and see if we can't see that you get the same answer that you expect when you don't consider air resistance, if you consider the case when air resistance is very small. Um, that would correspond to a very large terminal velocity. So if you have a large terminal velocity, this term in the, in the logarithm, this is a very small term. So we can look at the Taylor series, because we're always doing Taylor series when we're, whenever we're in, class, in physics, we're either approximating, you, approximating using a Taylor series or calling everything a mass on a spring and then using its Taylor series. That's more or less physics in a nutshell. So we can use the Taylor series for this expression. So one minus a small number is approximately equal to one, uh, equal to negative one plus one half epsilon squared plus one third epsilon cubed and so on. Now, Let's look over here at this term because here we are going to keep the first two terms and we're going to expand this. So we get y equals y naught plus v ter tau and then times a negative now this was one minus so this is x minus x naught over v zero x Tau, I think. Yeah, okay. Yeah, the tau's are going to cancel out there. And then we have plus one half x minus x zero naught v zero x tau quantity squared. plus v zero y plus v ter 
x minus x naught over u zero y. So what you can see here is that this term cancels out the v terminal term here. So you are left with y naught minus one half v ter tau. Ah, the taus are, we're going to end up with a tau on the bottom. v ter v zero x squared tau x minus x naught quantity squared plus v zero y x minus x naught over v zero, let's see, yeah, x my, there's an x minus x naught in there because all the other, so this term cancels this term and then we're left with just that term. So I have x minus x naught. And then I can use tau is m over b. And so v tear over tau is m over b and m g over b. So this is just g. So I am left here with negative g, which is to say that I get my quadratic equation. I, um, I see parabolic motion when I look at the limit of very large terminal velocity. In the case of terminal velocity, I don't have to, um, in the case of terminal velo very large terminal velocity, I can treat it as if there is no air resistance. So now um, what we are going to do is um, we're going to actually leave this as an exercise for the student. The range, which is the distance traveled in the x direction, if you consider the range in a vacuum, this is 2 times the initial x velocity times the initial y velocity divided by g. Um, and we can take the solution that we just got and figure out what the range is. Look in the limit of, uh, of small, um, we're going to expand about small times so that we can take a decent approximation. And we will get that the range, when you consider um, air resistance, is this vacuum range times approximately this vacuum range times four thirds vy zero over the terminal velocity. Um, so there is a slight correction depending on how fast it starts. Um, and you'd get larger corrections. Um, so here, if you set vy zero equal to zero, you would see that there's no correction. Uh, so you might need to consider higher order corrections if, um, if this correction isn't good enough. What a physicist does, the, to get this, the book took the first, um, it took the first, uh, I think it was the first two terms, you might need the first three terms. Okay, so example 2.4, the range of, uh, of objects, um, we will take the diameter to be 0.2 millimeters, and the velocity uh, is one meter per second, um, the initial velocity, and the angle is 45 degrees, so it's equally in the x and y direction. Um, so then for gold, 
and aluminum. The density is 16 grams per centimeter cubed and 2.7 grams per centimeter cubed um, or 16,000 kilograms per meter cubed, 27,000 kilograms per meter cubed. Um, if we consider the object in a vacuum, the range in this case is 10.2 centimeters. And the correction term, so four thirds VY zero over V tear is, uh, actually let me put it up here. Um, so we're sort of making a table. Uh, four thirds VY zero over V tear for gold works out to be 0.05 and for aluminum works out to be 0.3. So if you're dealing with gold pellets where gold is rather uh, dense, the gold term, the gold does not have as much of a correction factor. The air resistance uh, just doesn't slow it down as much. The force is the same on the gold and the aluminum pellets, but for the gold pellets, it because the gold is that much heavier, the, the force of air resistance is not slowing it down very much, whereas for the aluminum, it's slowing it down a lot more. So the range um, that you get for the gold pellets is 9.7 centimeters as opposed to 10.2. That's not a big correction. Whereas for the aluminum, it works out to be seven centimeters. So when you have something that is heavy, um, it does not uh, get slowed down as much by air resistance as when you have something that, that is light. So this actually gets at one of my favorite questions to ask on exams. When I'm teaching intro physics, I ask students, if you drop a pumpkin and a feather off the physics building at the same time, um, neglecting air resistance, will the pumpkin land first, the feather land first, or will they both land at the same time? When you ne neglect air resistance, it's really important for a physics major to know that they should land at the same time. When you consider air resistance, the heavier object is going to land first because the heavier object does not, it is not slowed down as much by air resistance. Okay, so uh, now we're going to talk about quadratic air resistance. So when the air resistance is proportional to velocity squared. And we can't solve this exactly for all cases because it is a second order nonlinear differential equation. So what I mean by that is because it depends on the velocity squared. Um, it, now that's not linear, it's quadratic. Um, and the, this type of equation tends to be a lot messier and you cannot solve it in general in all cases. Um, so what we're going to, so what we will see is we'll cover it in two special cases of horizontal motion only and linear motion only, or sorry, vertical motion only, meaning lined up with gravity or lined uh, perpendicular to gravity, um, but not consider the cases where both are relevant. Um, and in general, nonlinearity can lead to chaos, uh, but not in this case. Um, but this is the first type of problem where if you needed an exact solution considering both terms, you would need to have a comp you would need to solve this computationally. So we're going to start with our differential equation, m dv dt equals negative c v squared. All right, so then we are going to multiply on both sides by dt. And we get, and then I'm going to also, well, yeah, so we'll leave that, we'll leave our constants there. So I get m dv over v squared equals negative ct. I'm going to make this t prime because I'm going to integrate from 0 to t dt prime. 
prime, and I'm going to integrate on this side from v initial to v final. And this one is easy. Um, ah, let's see. I have an extra t prime for some reason. My first part lecture of the morning, the coffee has not kicked in yet. So I don't, I just want a t prime, a t prime, dt prime, and this is equal to negative ct. And then here I get a negative mv to the negative 1 from v initial to v final, which is <clears throat> m times 1 over v initial minus 1 over v final. And here I am going to divide by m on both sides. So I get, I'm just going to do So all of these constants are grouped with the time. And then I'm going to add this term. Uh, let me just write an extra step. Negative ct over m equals 1 over v initial plus or minus 1 over v final. And here I'm going to um, I'm going to add 1 over v final um, and add ct over m to both sides. That gives me 1 over v final equals 1 over v initial plus ct over m. And this, I'm going to then invert it. So I get v final equals 1 over 1 over v initial plus ct over m. I am going to multiply on top and bottom by v initial to give me v initial over 1 plus ct over m. All right, here we're going to check our units really quickly. So uh, the units of C have to be newtons over meters squared times second squared. So here, this V final equals V initial divided by some stuff. So as long as this is unitless, my units work out fine. So my units for CT over M are going to be Newton second squared per meter squared, uh, and then times seconds divided by meters. And this is, ah, sorry, divided by kilograms not meters. So here, this is kilogram meters per second squared times uh, second squared over, uh, seconds cubed over meters squared divided by kilograms. And there's a reason why we do this. When I, uh, when I multiplied here on top and bottom by V initial, I dropped a V initial. Um, so then I actually have V initial here. Uh, 
and it was in my notes, but I was not following my notes. All right, so then here I actually have another meters per second, and that gives, so, so let me erase this here. This was units of C, units of VI, units of time, and units of mass. So this is, I'm going to cancel out at least some of the terms to make life a little, oh, I should probably, now I, that works, but I probably should have canceled that one. It would have been meter. And here I have kilogram meters per second squared times seconds squared per meter kilogram. And you can see that that is in fact unitless. Fantastic. All right. So then we are going to rearrange this just a little bit to make it look nice and neat. Um, and we will call this VI over 1 plus T over tau. This is not the same tau as when we had the linear, um, when we had linear resistance. Um, tau is a variable we often use for a time constant. It tells us how rapidly the system responds. Um, so here you have a T in here, and this whole thing has to be unitless. We're going to call everything else um, tau. So tau is M over C V I. Um, and I'm actually going to write that answer up here. So we get that V as a function of time is the initial velocity over 1 plus T over tau. So as tau goes to infinity, um, this, uh, Sorry, as t goes to infinity, then uh, the velocity goes to zero. Um, but at least, so at t equals zero, the velocity is equal to the initial velocity. Um, and here I'm going to note down that tau is m over c v i. We're going to do what we did for the linear case, and we're going to integrate that expression that we just got to get the position as a function of time. All right, so we then have dx dt equals the initial over 1 plus t over tau. And then I'm going to multiply on both sides by dt. So I am left with dx equals vi over 1 plus t over tau dt. I'm going to integrate on both sides. So here I'm going to integrate from x0 to x final. And I will make this x prime. Um, and here I will rename my variable t prime. I'm going to integrate from 0 to t. So this simply becomes x final. I should call this x initial just for consistency. x final minus x initial equals. Then here, I will do this out just to illustrate. So u is going to be equal to 1 plus t prime over tau. du then equals 1 over tau d or t prime. So d t prime equals tau du. So then this integral becomes the v initial can come out in front. And I have a tau out in front. So v initial tau times the integral of du 
over u, which is equal to simply the natural log of u. And then I am going to plug this back in. So I get the initial tau equals natural log of 1 plus uh, t prime over tau. Now what I want to point out here, um, we talk about units. Whenever you are taking the function of something, so whether that when the, ar the argument of uh, logs and exponentials, sines and cosines, this should always be unitless. Now here, this is trivially unitless because we have t divided by tau, and both of them have units of time. So this is clearly unitless. But this is another way that you can check at intermediate stages that your work is in fact correct. All right, so then when I put in uh, the limits, I have zero to t. So this is v initial tau times the natural log of 1 plus t over tau minus the natural log of 1. Now the natural log of 1 is 0. So on this side, I am left with v initial tau natural log of 1 plus t over tau. All right, then I get that my answer is that x final equals x initial plus v initial tau times the natural log of 1 plus t over tau. All right, so this was for horizontal motion. put a little box around here. Um, and what you see is that um, this is going to grow very slowly. It never stops growing. So there is some, uh, it will approach, um, it, it will, so it will initially move faster and then it's going to slowly grow much more slowly. That's because the, um, the quadratic, uh, Dependence on the velocity is really going to slow the object down rather much faster than the linear dependence. All right, now we're going to consider vertical motion. So when we have vertical motion, our, uh, our Newton's second law becomes m dot equals mg minus cv squared. Um, and here we are going to note again that there is a terminal velocity. So v ter um, is equal to mg over the square root of mg over c. Um, and then we can write this. I'm going to divide through by m. And when I do that, and, and then I'm going to pull out a G. So I'm going to write dV dt is equal to G times 1 minus CV squared over MG, which is equal to G times 1 minus C, uh, minus v over v ter squared. So here, this, this has already given us a few examples where when we have a certain type of problems, there, problem, there's a natural scale. Um, so the natural scale for the velocity is the terminal velocity. So it, once you reach the terminal velocity, that's just going to be the velocity. What we see here is that when, when you reach the terminal velocity, just to check our equation, this becomes 1, this becomes 0, and dv dt um, becomes, uh, becomes 0. All right, and then we're going to do our usual trick. We're going to multiply on both sides by dt and rewrite the equation. 
So we get dv equals g 1 minus v over v ter squared dt. And so we can write this as dv over 1 minus v over v ter quantity squared equals g dt. All right, and then we integrate on both sides. Now we can do a quick unit check here. So this term is unitless, and this is a small change in velocity. So this has units of meters per second. This is meters per second squared times seconds, or meters per second. So we can tell here that at least so far we have the correct answer. Um, this side, we're going to integrate from 0 to t, and I'll rename my vari variable of integration t prime. I'm going to rename that integration variable v prime, and I'm going to integrate from v initial to v final. All right, this side is easy. This is just d, g, t. Um, and then on this side, what I'm going to do is use u equals v prime over v ter. So du equals d v prime over v ter, um, which gives me d v prime equals v ter d u. So then when I do this, I get v ter times the integral of du 1 minus u squared. Now this happens to be one of my favorite, this happens to be my favorite integral. Um, this is v ter is the inverse hyperbolic tangent of u. And then I'm going to plug back in what our expression for uh, v ter, or for u. This is v prime over v ter. And then we want to evaluate it from v initial to v final. Here, I'm just going to delete this line so that it's a little bit neater to see what the answer is. Why is this my favorite integral? This is my favorite integral because when I was in undergrad, I tutored calculus the entire way through at the Natural Sciences Tutorial Center, and uh, I had been tutoring calculus the night before. Someone had brought this integral, brought an integral like this in, and I had just, I'd been looking at the tables, and well, it's an inverse hyperbolic tangent. So someone had this, in, this integral on the board in the Society of Physics study room, and they went, I have no idea what this is. And I just looked up, and I said, oh, that's the inverse hyperbolic tangent. And what was funny is that they went, oh my god, you're so smart. And I went, no, I just have been looking at this recently. And I happened to get lucky that this was something that I had seen the night before. And now, I, I like that because I think that shows often when you're, when you're in classes like this, you can be very intimidated. Some of your classmates are undoubtedly breezing through this. And I want you to fight the urge to think they're smarter than me, they're better than me, they get this better. Maybe they've just seen it more recently, and, and also having advised for about 10 years and worked with a lot of students, um, often the students who are doing better are doing better because they have a stronger background, not because they have more talent or more ability. And sometimes it's because they're just working 10 times harder. Um, so the answer is, how do you do well in these classes? It is work hard and keep going and don't get discouraged. All right, now that my pep talk is over, so this is gonna be V ter 
inverse hyperbolic tangent. By the way, how can you tell it's an inverse hyperbolic tangent? You might be familiar with, uh, so 1 over 1 plus x squared dx, the in that integral is the inverse tangent of x. Um, you can get that by using u substitution with u equals 1 plus cosine of, uh, I'm sorry, u equals 1 plus cosine of x. Or, sorry, u, what, uh, you use 1 plus x squared, uh, use x equals cosine of theta. When you use that u substitution, you will get here uh, 1 plus cosine theta, and you can use your trig identities. Um, it's a little bit hairy. But once you know this integral, well, this is the same thing, but with a minus sign. Well, lo and behold, because of these deep relationships between uh, sine func sinusoidal functions and complex numbers, you get an i squared there. If you have a complex uh, argument in your tangent, it becomes the inverse hyperbolic tangent. It's beautiful. Um, all right, so here we have our integration limits the initial, let me switch back to my regular color. The initial minus inverse hyperbolic tangent, the final. Um, and then we can rearrange this. So we get GT over V tear. Uh, equals let's see make sure I've got all of this right inverse hyperbolic tangent the initial ah here I have a sign error um, because my first, this should be the final, let me just switch, rather than switching the signs. This is the final, and this is the initial. So I get the inverse hyperbolic tangent of the final plus the inverse hyperbolic tangent of the initial. Um, and I this should be a minus sign. So I get that V final is equal to the hyperbolic tangent of G T over V tear plus the inverse hyperbolic tangent of the initial velocity. I am going to write it up over here. So I have for uh, vertical motion, I get V of t is equal to the hyperbolic tangent of g t over v tear plus the inverse hyperbolic tangent of the initial Ah, this should have been V initial over V tear. And here I dropped some terms. How did I know that? I swear that coffee hasn't really kicked in yet. How did I know that I had messed up? Because this is the most important thing for you. 
Um, I knew that I had messed up because my units were incorrect. I had to have something unitless over here, and I did not. Um, the difference between you and me is not how many mistakes we make. It's how quickly we correct them and we catch them and correct them. So because I have been doing this for a very long time, um, I see I have these built-in checks where I'm asking myself as I get an answer. And here, I've left that out of here. I check myself and make sure that I am getting the right units. So this term, the argument of a function has to be unitless. And I saw that and I went, that isn't unitless. I made a dumb mistake. And I went back here, it was unitless here. Um, and then this has to have units of velocity. So I made a mistake. That's the same mistake because here, when I took the, when I out solved this algebraically, I had to take the, invert, the hyperbolic tangent of both sides, and that left me VF over V tear, which had the right units. And because we're writing up our results over here, we're going to write here V tear is mg over, the square root of mg over c. All right, so here's where I return to the book. What I did so far on this is that I was actually allowing uh, the initial velocity not to be zero and the initial y and x positions not to be zero, and that becomes hairy and ugly for the next step. So I'm going to skip that, and we're just going to set the initial velocity equal to zero. We do what we have done before. We're going to take this as dx dt equals v tear hyperbolic tangent of gt over v tear plus the inverse hyperbolic tangent of v initial over v tear. All right, here I want to add an aside. So, ah, well, let's first set up our integrals. You can see this one is going to be ugly. Um, and here we have, um, let's see, this is a constant, this is t, so we have, uh, we're going to set this from x, let's add, so this is actually dy dt, because it's in the y direction, so the integral dy from y initial to y final, and we're going to set y initial equal to zero, because why not? Um, this is going to give us y final, or y of t, um, equals the integral v tear of the hyperbolic tangent of gt over v tear, um, plus the inverse hyperbolic tangent of v initial over v tear dt. And then here we're going to do the integration limits from 0 to t. The hyperbolic tangent is uh, e to the negative x. No, e to the positive x minus e to the negative x over e to the positive x plus e to the negative x. Um, so this, the, this is so this is all constant, and then you have to take you need something of the form the in integral of the hyperbolic ta tangent. The u substitution is the easy part. Whew, this is an ugly one, um, and. This Um, and we get v tear squared over g times the uh, times the natural log of the hyperbolic cosine of g t over v tear. 
Okay, so how do we really do these in the real world? I do not, I do not assign problems like this where students have to do very nasty, hairy, ugly integrals on, I don't put them on tests. Um, I sometimes might ask students to set it up. Uh, if I have a test where I ask students to use it, they are allowed to have an equation sheet so that they could write it down. Sometimes I ask students to uh, do homework problems that might involve, hair, involve hairy, ugly integrals. I do that because it's useful to be able to. This is still quite the challenging integral, and if I assign this on a homework problem, I might give a hint. What you should do, however, is become familiar with an integral table. Um, so an integral table is where you can look up a whole bunch of standard forms. I don't think it is a useful exercise to try to do this from scratch every single time. It is good to sort of kind of know how you would set it up. The other thing that we use nowadays is that is uh, computer programs. The most common is Mathematica. You can set it up so that it will in fact do the integrals. Um, and that saves you a lot of time. When I was a student, we used Maple. Um, I'm still, I still tend to use Maple because I know it. Um, you can use what you want. What I require is that my students, if they use an integral table or a, math, a program for solving things mathematically without doing it by hand, I want them to tell me when they write the answer down that they have done so. I still remember from my days of being a teaching assistant and I was grading uh, class, uh, I was grading homework for uh, differential equations for engineers class and I, you'd see uh, there was a problem with a very hairy, ugly integral on it and the answer was in the back of the book. So several students would have very nice, neat handwriting setting up the problem. They set up the problem, then they would have some very messy handwriting and for the next several steps, and then poof, there out comes the right answer. I marked them down for it if that was all they did. I had said very clearly, you can use an integral table, but you have to tell me that you used it. And they didn't, so they got marked down and they complained to the teacher and it didn't work. Um, so it's okay to use tools, but you want to make sure that you know how to use the tools and that you convey when people are grading that you have used them. And you also should make sure it's okay with the instructor that you use the tools that you are using. Um, okay, so um, then we can take an example and look at um, example 2.5, the terminal speed of a baseball. Um, so here we have a mass of 0.15 kilograms, a diameter of seven centimeters, um, and C equals gamma times the diameter squared. And for air, gamma is 0.25 newton seconds squared per meters to the fourth, V ter, is equal to the square root of mg gamma d squared, which works out to be 35 meters per second or 80 miles per hour. So you will often hear in baseball games that, uh, that baseballs have reached speeds up to and even faster than this. Um, when they go faster than this, the force of drag, the, the force due to drag on the baseball, because it's going so fast, is actually larger than the force of gravity. Okay, so now we'll talk about, this is when you only have, we have two solutions up on the board for the two cases where you have either entirely horizontal motion or entirely vertical motion. That's not true in general, even when we talk about the baseball, the, the, a baseball flying through the air moves both vertically and horizontally. So what can we do? Our initial equation is mr double dot 
equals mg, the force due to gravity, minus c v squared v hat. Um, and we can write, uh, so v hat is equal to v x x hat plus v y y hat divided by the magnitude of v. And then v squared is equal to vx squared plus vy squared. g in this case is negative constant g y hat. And we get m x double dot x hat plus y double dot y hat is equal to negative g y hat minus c, and then we have v squared times v hat. That is going to give, so I will just write it out ug big and ugly, vx squared plus vy squared over the square root of vx squared plus vy squared times uh, v x x hat plus v y y hat. This term here we can replace by the square root of v x squared plus v y squared. I have typos, even when I'm writing by hand. All right, so this is our full ugly equation. We can pull out the, um, we can pull out the x and y components, and we get m y double dot, I will actually replace y double dot as with v y dot, so m v y dot equals negative g minus c v x squared plus v y squared square root times v y and then m v x dot that's all of the y components now we're going to pull out the x components and i'm going to call x double dot v x dot so m v x dot equals negative c vx squared plus vy squared times vx. All right, so this is now an extremely nonlinear differential equation. It is, uh, it is second order in x, it is first order in vx and vy. It is a set, it is actually a set of uh, coupled equations. So to solve it, so this equation depends on that equation and vice versa. And that makes it particularly hairy and ugly. Um, the only way that you can do this is to solve it numerically. And that is why, um, that is why what we're going to do is uh, learn in my class, we're going to be having you guys learn how to do problems, how to solve problems numerically. All right, so now we're going to cover sec section 2.5, which is the motion of a charge in a uniform magnetic field. And at this point, for this problem, I am going to use both complex analysis and uh, in one approach to solving the problem and use matrix algebra. And the reason I'm going to do this is because I think that these, I'm going to show you a few different ways to solve this problem. I'm actually going to deviate from the book a little bit. What I would recommend is that you uh, go back and I'm going to post a couple of other videos. Um, I'm going to go through the section 2.5 on complex analysis and give a, flesh it out a little bit more and give a somewhat more um, full overview of complex analysis, and I'm also going to give a crash course in matrix algebra. So if you have not had um, complex analysis and are not comfortable with 
um, imaginary numbers. And if you are not comfortable with uh, matrix algebra, I would uh, recommend that you uh, do those sections first. All right, so here what we're going to do is that we are going to talk about the motion of a charged particle in a uniform magnetic field. We are going to choose the magnetic field to be B z hat. So we're going to choose the magnetic field to be only in the z hat direction. Um, we will then write the most generic velocity that we can. We're going to ignore all other forces, so we're going to assume that the other forces are negligible compared to the force due to the magnetic force. And we are the magnetic field. We're going to write the velocity as Vx x hat plus Vy y hat plus Vz z hat. Um, and then our force is given by Q times the velocity crossed with the magnetic field. So here, um, I'm going to do something. I'm going to use the coordinate approach to doing a cross product. Um, so I'm going to use the cross product of each of the individual forces, but individual components. The reason I'm honestly doing that is because this board does the mirror image of whatever I uh, write, so I don't want to be, I, I don't want to throw myself off by using the right hand rule. So we have x hat cross with y hat is z hat, y hat cross with z hat is x hat, and, uh, and then I need z hat cross with y hat is, let's see, I want x, sorry, z hat cross with x hat. I'm trying to put the positive ones in order is y hat. And I just double checked that. I would uh, advise that you check it yourself real quickly. Um, and the, we're going to treat each of the, um, so basically the, if you have a right-handed coordinate system, every time you go in alphabetical order, X, Y, Z, it's positive. X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. So I'm gonna use those components for doing the cross product. Um, and here I have, everything is cro the cross product of something with Z hat. I'm going to pull the, so I have Q, B, and then Z hat cross with Z hat is zero. So here I have um, V, X, X hat cross with Z hat, and that involves switching the order, so that gives me a negative y hat. And here I have y hat, I have a vy, y hat cross with z hat, that gives me a positive x hat. Um, so this is, um, this gives me m v x dot x hat plus v y dot y hat. Okay, so now I have, I can separate these two equations um, in terms of their coordinates, and what you're going to see is that I have coupled differential equations. So I can write this I'm going to pull together the x components, and I have m v x dot equals q b v y, um, and this is the x components, and m v y dot equals negative q b v x um, and then m v z dot equals zero. Okay, so first of all from this one we can see that uh, 
the velocity in the z direction is just a constant. And that's already, uh, that's already giving us part of it. Um, and I'm going to do two different ways to solve the equation. So the equation, so what I'm going to do here is, uh, first of all, rearrange it a little bit. And I'm going to write vx dot equals qb over m vy and vy dot equals negative qb over m vx. And I'm putting them up there um, and we are going to then define omega equal omega squared equals um, I don't know, just plain omega. Omega is QB over M. We're going to call it omega suggestively um, because it will turn out to be motion in a circle, um, but we're going to show that. So when we define those, uh, when we define this constant as omega, then we can rewrite our coupled equations somewhat neater in terms of this term omega. So here we can write vx dot equals omega vy and vy dot equals negative omega vx. Okay, so we're going to do two approaches to solving this equation. Um, and the first one is that we're going to make this into a second order. So this is currently a set of two first order coupled differential equations. First order because the highest order derivative is the first derivative. Um, you could also consider it a second derivative of uh, each of these two components, and then it would be a set of second order um, the differential equations, but they are coupled. Um, but we can so make this a single um, differential equation um, instead of a coupled differential set of coupled differential equations by V taking the derivative. So VX double dot equals omega vy dot. Well, now I have an equation for vy dot. So this is omega times negative omega vx. Um, so here, this gives us vx double dot equals negative omega squared vx. Um, and this differential equation should look some should look familiar. So here I now have a first order or say a second order um, differential equation. Um, we can do a trial solution. We will write the x equals a cosine omega t plus b sine omega t. Here I'm already you know, what you could do is write this as a different variable and then show that this is, yeah, let's go do that. Let's write this as a different variable. We will see that that constant is omega. So I'll put a K in there. Um, Vx dot equals negative a k sine omega t plus b k cosine omega t vx double dot is negative a k squared cosine k t minus b k squared sine omega t. So here I can pull out a negative k squared a cosine k t plus b sine, ah, here I flipped back into omegas, b sine k t 
So this just tells us that Vx double dot with this trial solution is negative k squared times Vx. And then we can plug that in here and we get negative k squared Vx plus omega squared Vx equals zero or k squared equals omega squared. So um, our trial solution works. Um, we can write this trial solution in a few different forms. Um, let's first finish this form. So once we have Vx, um, we can solve for Vy. So Vy is equal to Vx dot divided by omega. So that is one over here. We solved, we showed that the constant is omega. So Vx dot is one over omega times negative a omega sine omega t plus b omega cosine omega t. So what you get is that Vx is equal to negative a sine omega t plus b cosine omega t. So when, um, if we take, if a is, and let us choose a equals one and b equals, um, b equals zero. So then when you have, uh, so then your x component is, when your x component is at its largest, your y component is zero. As the x component increases, the y component decreases. This just describes circular motion. Um, I will let you think through this one, but, if, but this term as well describes circular motion. Now, uh, uh, this was the y component. Now, you also could choose to, um, you also could choose to write your vx instead as a cosine omega t plus phi. Um, and if you use that as a trial solution, you would see that in fact it also works. Um, when you take the derivative, you will get an omega. Um, and you would get that there's, so there's still, there's a phi, uh, there, sorry, there's a phase difference between the um, x and y components. They are exactly out of phase. Let's do that trial solution real quick. Vx dot is negative a omega cosine omega t plus phi vx double dot is equal to negative omega squared a, uh, sorry, this should be a sine, negative omega squared uh, a cosine omega t or negative omega squared vx and plug this in, this works. Then when we figure out our vy, vy is, um, is vx dot times, sorry, vy is vx dot divided by omega, so vy is negative a sine omega t plus phi. So here, these are exact, the x and y components are exactly out of phase. So you could choose this form um, through using trigono trigonometric identities. You can actually show that these two forms are equivalent. Um, you also can use, here's what I'm going to this is what might be a little less familiar. Let us choose Vx equals a e to the plus or minus omega, i omega t. 
So, well, actually, let's just start by assuming some exponential. E, Vx equals a kx times t. The reason this is a good trial solution is because we have something where its second derivative is proportional to the function itself. Um, so we have two classes of functions that fit that, sines and cosines and exponents. So Vx dot is a k e to the kt. Vx double dot is equal to a k squared e to the kt, which is equal to k squared Vx. All right, so then we can plug this back in. So here I get k vx, k squared vx equals negative omega squared vx. And then when I solve for what is k, I get that this solution does in fact work as long as k is plus or minus i omega squared where i is equal to the square root of negative 1. So I find that I can write the solution vx equals a e, I actually can, I have two solutions here, a e to the i omega t plus b e to the positive i omega t. Um, and when I plug those in, I get, so, so I try to solve for y, um, vx is equal to negative i a e to the i omega t, and I need my omega plus v i omega e to the i omega t, and this is equal to i omega, ah, well, yeah. So let's use, let's actually not simplify, we can't simplify much. Uh, Vy equals 1 over omega times Vx dot. So Vy is negative i a e to the i omega t plus i b e to the pot, uh, this should have been a minus, e to the i omega t. Okay, so this works if I allow the velocity to be constant. I'm actually going to use i equals e to the negative pi over 2 times i, and I can rewrite vy equals, or sorry, equals positive, but I can put, um, I can put my negative sign in here, so I get a e to the negative i omega t minus or sorry, plus a pi over 2 plus b e i omega t plus pi over 2. So um, I simply have my uh, x solution shifted in phase um, by pi over 2. And because I, I then have to allow the a's and the b's to be complex, um, I can then use Euler's equation. And in principle, because, so Euler's equation says e to the i theta equals cosine theta plus i sine theta. So these two solutions with different constants are equivalent. Okay, so now we're going to deal with this in a different way, um, and this is going to draw on matrix algebra. So this is where if you haven't had this, I'm going to record a crash course just as a quick uh, introduction to matrix algebra, and I would advise that you look at that first. So we're going to write this 
set of coupled differential equations like this. as a set of matrices. So then I can write this as V dot equals A V, where this is A. And we are going to try a trial solution of the velocity is some vector E to the lambda T. So let us call it, let me go with Instead of calling it A like I did in my notes, I'm going to call it uh, eta. And we will call these constants A and B. These are just regular constants times E to the lambda T. So now V dot equals lambda times eta. e to the lambda t. So this is, and then our equation is that v dot equals lambda v, and I'm going to subtract lambda v from both sides. So I get the equation um, let's see V dot let's see hang on I'm gonna back up just a little bit I have so I have the equation a V That's this times this. Equals V dot and that is equal to lambda V. So I can Subtract a lambda b on, lambda v from both sides. And I get a v minus lambda v, which is equal to a um, minus, well, a v. minus lambda times the identity matrix times V, which is equal to A minus lambda times the identity matrix times V, and that all has to equal zero. So then I can ask what values of lambda make this true? And I can take the determinant of both sides. So that tells me that the determinant of A minus lambda I has to equal zero. So that tells me, given that this is my matrix, that the determinant of negative lambda, negative lambda, that's from my identity term, and there's no terms, uh, non-zero terms there, negative omega, omega, that has to equal zero. This gives me lambda squared plus omega squared, which gives me lambda equals plus or minus i omega. Okay, now I have to find the vectors v, which make this true. Um, I'm going to find something called the eigenvector, so I will have a vector up to a constant. And then I can define any solution as a sum of, uh, so I'm going to find some general solutions. And any possible solution is the sum of different co linear combinations of those. So now, I to get 
the eigenvectors, a times this eigenvector equals lambda x. So, 0 omega, negative omega, 0. Here, I, x might not be the best decision for a variable name, but I'm going to stick with it. Um, and then here, this has to equal omega lambda times uh, times x. So this is plus or minus i omega x1. And here, plus or minus i omega x2. And then here, this has to equal, I'm do this matrix multiplication, I get omega x2 and negative omega x1. So, here, I can write this as two separate equations. I have, I, my omegas cancel out because I have an omega everywhere. And I am left with x2 equals i x1 uh, equals plus or minus i x1 and x1 equals minus plus i. I dropped here this one. That's x1. This should be an x2. x1 equals minus and plus i x2. Now, this is a little tricky. What I'm going to do is multiply by i on both sides and we will see when I have i squared it changes the sign of this so I get a plus or minus x2 equals i x1 and that's just the same equation as this so I get I got two equations but they're actually different versions of the same equation. Um, so, because these two equations are redundant, I only need one of them. I can choose x1 equals 1, and x2 then would equal plus or minus i. So this is really two solutions, 1 i and 1 negative i. Um, and that actually really means that, so I can write these as 1 e to the plus or minus i pi over 2. So this is a phase shift. So given that my solutions are, so I have solutions v equals some constant a 1 e to the plus or minus i pi over 2 times my I found that my omega was plus or minus my, my lambda was plus or minus i omega if I choose the plus sign, that's one answer. And then B is the, co the constant here. So no matter what, the X and the Y components are always off by a phase of pi over 2. 
Um, and then if I wanted to find, uh, so I could take the real parts of this and I would see that uh, I could write this equivalently as uh, A cosine omega t sine omega t plus b cosine omega t. That's because cosine of theta is equal to cosine of negative theta. It is an even function. So I have my full answer is that the x component and the y component are out of phase. And I can write them either as sines um, and cosines or as, uh, as complex exponentials. All right, I am not going to do the complex analysis in this video. It's going to be a separate video so that it's easier to come back and review. So that's going to end chapter two for us.